Okay, is that actually working? Perfect. Okay. How's that? Okay. I can speak out of the side of my mouth. <laughs> All right. This is clearly not my area of expertise. Okay. We're going to see if the mask holds it in place. Well, thank you. I. I'm going to, by the time we get to the concert, I'm going to put it on because I'm insisting that the singers wear masks, so it seems bad if I'm not. Although if we only have four people in the audience, I guess more people are coming later. Okay. We will see what happens. All right. The organ. <laughs> so, uh, Mozart called it the, sing the king of instruments. Robert Schumann said it is the most unforgiving instrument, and it's very true. It's a really tough instrument to play, uh, but I love it anyway. So what is a pipe organ? What, what has to have, an instrument have to have to be considered a pipe organ? I thought about this a lot, and I came up with three things that are, have to be present to have a pipe organ. And the first one is that you need an artificial wind supply. So unlike most wind instruments, where you have somebody blowing into a tube of some kind, a clarinet, a saxophone, a trumpet, with the organ, we have an artificial source of air, and so it's some kind of a bellows system. And this already existed in folk instruments, uh, in the instrument that we know as the bagpipe, right, or the musette. It had a bag that was indirectly blown by a human being, but it allowed them to control the air and get a lot of volume out of the thing. Okay, the second thing it has to have is one note per pipe. So unlike a recorder, which has holes in it, and I can play different notes with that one pipe, in an organ, every pipe only plays one note. And again, there was a folk instrument built on that principle already, which was... The panpipe, exactly, the syrinx, uh, another direct ancestor of the organ. A syrinx, S-Y-R-I-N-X. -S <laughs> there you go. That's right, oh, it's a garable word. Yeah, it's a, good, it's a good one. Okay. And it has to have a valve system, because if I have artificial air going into a whole bunch of pipes at once, it's going to be really, really loud. So instead we're going to have some kind of a system to control which pipe is getting the air at any moment. Nowadays, we use keys to do that. Uh, in earlier organs, they had different ways of doing it. And this is a valve system, and people have known about how to make valves for a long time. So those are the three elements we have to have. And if we define that as being the prerequisites for calling something a pipe organ, when did this originate? And the answer is, who knows? We know that they were building instruments on this principle as far back as 300 BC because we have writings from ancient Greece about them. And uh, before that, we don't know. Now, this pipe organ that you would have seen in 300 BC does, looks nothing like what we consider a pipe organ to be. It was more like a gigantic bagpipe. They had these huge bags that they filled with air, and each bag had a block on it with three pipes and each pipe had a valve on the top of it. And guys would step on the bags to, de to push the air into the pipes, and somebody was running around turning those valves off and on in order to get the tone. All right. So why bother, right? Well, you would need at least 12 people to play this instrument. And the reason, I think, is it was really loud. Okay, that was, that was the big selling point of the early organ. So it could be used at sporting events, right? Here we have gladiatorial games, and in the background you see somebody clearly playing a version of the pipe organ. And it was also good for religious gatherings where you had a large bunch of people for a big religious service. And if you think about it, today where do you hear organs? Baseball games, hockey games, 
churches and synagogues. So we still use the organ for those same functions that it was being used back in early Roman times. So, again, I'm skipping over tons of history here, but it started off, we knew, know about it in Greek 300 B.C. The Arabs were very interested in the Greek knowledge, and so they preserved the knowledge of this thing, and eventually it came to the Byzantine Empire and then to Western Europe, where it got adopted into use in churches. And here we see some monks playing at something recognizable as a pipe organ. The guy in the front has the bad job of just kneeling there and pumping the bellows, the guy in the back gets to actually play music. Uh, now, at this point, the organ evolves in two different directions. You're getting bigger and bigger churches, right? They're discovering how to build bigger and bigger churches without having them fall down, and so they need bigger and bigger instruments in order to make enough sound to fill that church. And this we're going to call the great organ. These are great big church organs in great big churches. The other direction is little organs, right? They like the one that we saw with just the th three monks playing it. Small instruments you might have in a chapel, in a monastery, um, something like that. And these were getting smaller and smaller. And as, the, as their uh, mechanical abilities increased, they were getting much more uh, easy to play. And that's a good thing. <laughs> so back to the big organs. The big organs are loud and they're used to accompany chanting. So we know here on Sunday mornings, Jim goes, the Lord be with you, and we go, and also with you. Well, the guy on the organ is going, bum, 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 bum. And notice I'm banging with my fist. That's how these were played. The mechanics of them was, in a sense, primitive, but I had to depress this key, which had to you know, pull up lever, which had to pop a thing off the bottom of the pipe in order to get the air into it. So they were very hard to play. And the bigger the pipes were, the harder it was to play the keys because a big pipe needs a big pallet at the bottom and that needs a big piece of wood to pull it. So it was tough work. But they used it to accompany the chants that the congregation would sing. Meanwhile, the small organs are getting smaller and smaller and to the place where you could put one on top of a table now, the one on the left is called a positif. That's a little organ that would sit on top of a table, and one person would be behind it pumping the bellows, and the person in the front gets to play the thing. The other one is called a regal, and that's another kind of little organ. It uses a pipe that's on a different principle. It's a reed pipe, which I'll talk about in a minute. So we've got these two now very different paths that organ evolution is taking. They're also starting to develop different kinds of pipes. Uh, this was an era of great experimentation, lots of things going on in instrument building. And they were discovering that if they built a pipe out of metal, it sounded different than if they built it out of wood. If they built it with a stopper at the end of it, it had a different tone than one that didn't have a stopper. And so they started to develop all these different kinds of pipes. Now the three pipes on the right here that look very different are reed pipes, and I mentioned that Regal played reed pipes. They have at the bottom what's called a fixed reed, so it's got a cut into the bottom of the cylinder and a piece of flexible metal or horn or reed against it that's gonna flap to make the noise, just like a clarinet or a saxophone works. So they make a very different kind of sound, a really buzzy uh, sound which was really popular at the time. Okay, so now I've got a little instrument and I've got, say, a row of of flue pipes, the first type, and a row of reed pipes and a row of wooden pipes, I want to be able to selectively play one or another group of pipes. I want to stop the other ones. And that's the origin of the organ stop. It was not originally to turn on pipes, it was to turn off pipes. Nowadays we say I pulled on a stop, but when you think about it, that's pretty contradictory. It's a stop it, but I'm using it to start the pipes, but it comes from the fact that originally it was to cut off a bunch of pipes. On the right, you see some stop pull knobs from an organ, and they just went hog wild with creating these different kinds of pipes, and organs would have tons and tons of different sorts of pipes on them. And they also started to use this same stop mechanism on the great organ so that they could cut it down a little bit for softer or louder stuff. All right, so now, we're ready for the first big 
technological leap, to, which gives us sort of the classic organ. And it went something like this. Imagine that I'm the music director at a big cathedral church, and I'm playing my organ by whacking away at the, pedal, uh, the keys with my fists, uh, but I also now have a choir because music is starting to develop into this polyphony with multiple voices going at once. And so maybe I've got eight or 12 people back there behind me to sing some little pieces of the mass where the congregation is being quiet. How do I accompany them? I can't accompany them on the great organ. It's much too loud. So I say, I know, I'll go home and I'll get that positif organ that sits on my table, and I'll bring it here and I'll put it on top of the great organ console, and then I can play the great organ, or I can play my little positif when the choir is singing. Oops, so you get two keyboards. Somebody says, hey, why not have two instruments? I can just have two keyboards, and the lower one can play the great organ, and the top one can play that little positif organ for the choir. To this day, organs with two keyboards, often the lower one is called the great, and the upper one is called the choir, because that was the origin of them. It was a combining of these two things. So that was a big step in the development of the organ. And then they went hog wild, and they started adding more and more keyboards as time went on. The other thing was, remember I told you how hard it was to hit those keys down for the low notes? Somebody had the brilliant idea of saying, well, I'll attach a rope to the bottom of that key and put it down to the ground where I'll have a lever, and I can stomp on the lever, and it'll pull down that key and play that note. I don't have to hit it with my hand. And that was the origin of the pedal keyboard. If you've never been up to a pipe organ, you might not know that there is a keyboard that the organist is playing with his feet, which is one of the things that's so cool about being an organ player. You get to goof around with this thing with your feet. All right, so we've got the combination of the two keyboards now, and we've got the pedal. These are the things that I need for a classic organ, and now I can go nutso. And so they created more and more keyboards, and they had different functions. You know, here's the one I use for the great organ. Here's the one I use to accompany the choir. Here's the one I use to have an echo effect. I can have some pipes in the back of the church, and I can play a ping here and then play this keyboard, and the sound will come from the back of the church. And in fact, there's a whole genre of organ music, of echo pieces. And one of these days, I'm going to figure out how to play that little organ back there from this console. It's possible so that I can do that. This is the organ at the Wanamaker. It's called the Wanamaker organ. There used to be a huge department store in New York called Wanamaker's, and they put this organ in, which I think to this day is the largest organ in the United States. It's got six keyboards, and each one of those little rectangles is a stop. Uh, and we'll talk about the other stuff there in a minute. Okay, so this is all the things we need to have a Baroque organ. An organ like Bach would have played or Honda would have played. And its characteristics are it's got a very bright tone. Uh, little or no tremolo, you know, or vibrato, they, they didn't want a lot of that. The pedals have become independent now and are really able to balance off against either of the keyboards. And it uses, it's suited to do what's called terrace dynamics. And this is, again, not just for organs, all instruments, uh, instrumental music of this time tended to go this way. You'd have something that was really loud, and then something that's really soft, and then something that's really loud, but you didn't have things getting louder and things getting softer. That crescendo and diminuendo always existed to an extent, but it didn't become a big deal in music until the classic period after the Baroque period. So it didn't matter that you couldn't do that on the organ. The organ doesn't matter how hard you hit the key, it's always the same loudness for the particular stop you have on, unlike a piano. But that suited the music of the time. So we got the Baroque organ. Until we had the invention of the swell. So somebody thought, what if I took these organ pipes and I put them in a box and I put a Venetian blind in front of it, then when I open the louvers of the Venetian blind, it's gonna get louder and when I close them, it's going to get softer. And now I can do a swell. And so they call this the swell organ. Certain stops on the organ will be in a swell box. And as organs developed, they started to put these swell boxes more and more. Now, here's a question. How the heck is the organist supposed to 
make that swell open and close. I'm using this hand on this keyboard, this hand on this keyboard, my feet are playing the pedal keyboard. What's left, right? So they tried various things. The one that didn't ultimately win out but was popular for a while was a knee lever. So I could push this thing with my knee and open the swells that way and you know, come back like that. Ultimately, the thing that they hit on was to have like a car's accelerator pedal, uh, except that it stays where you put it. Um, and so you're playing a melody on the keyboard with your feet, and then you have to get one foot off onto this thing and press the, the swell pedal. But they learned how to do it. And this gave me the ability now, as we get into the Romantic era, to develop an organ that's suited to Romantic music, which was very different from Baroque music. So they had swell boxes. They wanted now a thick tonal texture. If you think about Romantic novels, Gothic novels, it's all about darkness and fog and this sort of thing. So the music also tended to have this really dark, thick quality. I'm going to play a piece from that era today, so you'll get a chance to hear that. Tremolo, they liked now the, the very dramatic roar of vibrato. And they started to really get into imitating orchestral instruments with their organ pipes for several reasons. Now, there, this had always been a feature of pipe organs. You would have a stop that was called trumpet, a stop that was called flute. These were imitating existing instruments. But what's happening in the Romantic era is that the orchestra is developing, right? Box time, the orchestra, a few string players, maybe a trumpet, maybe a, an oboe or something. By the time we get to Wagner, we've got flutes, oboes, clarinets, bassoons, horns, trumpets, trombones, all of these things. And what we don't have is musical reproduction. So if you're sitting here in Sonoma and you've heard about this guy Wagner, you've got no chance to listen to his music. There's no radio, there's no record players, there's no MP3 players. But if you have somebody in town who's an organist, you've got an organ that can imitate orchestral sounds, then he can play a Wagner overture on the organ and you can get a sense of what this music sounds like. So organs in the 19th century were everywhere. When uh, Sonoma Arts Live agreed to, uh, got some wonderful money from the Rotarians to rebuild the, music, the theater here in the high school, they had to tear out a pipe organ that was in there. This had been a, a middle school, I think, and, but it had an organ. You know, they were very, very common. Um, for just this reason, that in a small town, particularly if you wanted to hear a big music concert, uh, the organ was the way to go. Okay, so now time marches on. Uh, regional differences. In different countries, they liked different things with their organs. And actually, this, thought, this is a little bit, uh, this slide should have been a little bit earlier. The Germans liked bright organs, the French liked these dark, thick organs. The, Spanish like these really brassy instruments. Uh, and of course, as this colonial stuff started to go on, they started to take their organ building techniques and, and traditions to different countries. All right, time marches on. What about the pump organ? <laughs> I have to throw in the pump organ because I love pump organs. I got my first pump organ when I was in high school, and I loved it and, and hauled it around for years. The pump organ works on a slightly different principle First of all, it's not blowing air, it's sucking air through the reeds that make the sound. It's also called a reed organ. And they're not uh, beater reeds like we described, they're what's called free reeds. So it's just a metal tongue that's vibrating. This is the same principle you see in, in uh, uh, harmonica. So they discovered that they could build this thing, you could pump it with your feet to so you don't now need two people to play the thing, and you could have different stops, and sometimes these got quite elaborate. Sometimes they even had pipes as well. I was interested to see when Sylvia and I went to Europe, um, a lot of the big cathedrals had reed organs in them, what they call harmoniums, and a lot of the great uh, composers from the Romantic era wrote for these instruments, Vierne and, and Franck and people like that. Uh, on the far right, I've got the thing. This is an in, uh, developed in India, and this is another one-person instrument that's got a little bellows that you can play like this with one hand, and you can play the keyboard with the other. So it's still, the harmonium is still alive and well. Uh, I think we've got somebody trying to get in here. Uh, 
All right. Now the organ goes off in new directions. Uh, so I put the picture up from in the medieval times. Now you've got the four guys who got the schlubby job of, of pumping the thing and two guys who get to play it. And then by the time we get to the 1950s, it's become a home entertainment center, right? Uh, the electronic organ allows people to have an organ in the home. And this was very, very popular. Again, in the 50s and 60s, lots of people wanted to have this. Uh, it also went to the theaters, right? Silent movies, if you've been to my silent movie things, I play the, the organ here. The big theaters had these big organs, and Wurlitzer was the most famous builder of these things. And the theater organ uh, had high wind pressure, so it could be really big Hollywood kind of sound, lots of uh, sound effects. You had a key that could make it sound like gunshots or ch you know, church chimes or flea sirens, because you're accompanying a movie and you're trying to do the sound effects. And they liked the sound with this big, big vibrato. If you listen to the uh, organs at a hockey game or a, or a baseball game, it's got that really <laughs> kind of quality. That's the big vibrato. All right. So they invent the electronic organ. And uh, basically, there were a bunch of acoustical scientists working at places like Bell Labs and starting to understand how sound works. And they built these things called oscillators, which could create different kinds of sounds. And they started to combine them and say, hey, this could sort of sound like an organ. You know, we could, we could put this into a little case, and people could play an organ with just electronics. Um, and like I say, the home entertainment industry was a big, big uh, market for these things. Now, music had changed, right? By the time we get to the 1950s, people want to play bossa nova, they want to play jazz, they want to play uh, rock and roll. And so these organs were built often with rhythm sections that you could set up to play different kinds of bongos or whatever. Um, and a lot of uh, kind of intelligence built into them to make it very easy uh, to, to play decently on the instrument. It also went into jazz and rock and roll. So the guy on the left is playing a Hammond B3, which was a re is, is still really beloved by uh, jazz players. I played one of those at my first uh, church organist job that we didn't know it was a jazz instrument. Uh, and then on the right is the Doors, and they had a very famous uh, organist in their group. And in fact, you start listening to classic rock, there's a lot of organ in it. You know, John Sebastian with the Love and Spoonful, or the uh, Proclaharum, you hear a lot of organ stuff. Okay, so organs going off to the, you know, the big romantic organs, we've got the big theater organs, we've got the jazz and rock and roll organs. It's inevitable that a reaction sets in. There was also a thing, starting in the late 50s, where people started to get interested in old instruments. And a very famous guy, Walter Damrosch, was sort of the spearhead of this. Because he said, look, you know, we play Bach Brandenburg concertos with a piano and, you know, trumpets and violins and stuff. But Bach's instruments were very different. He wasn't using a piano. He was using a harpsichord. He wasn't using violins. He was using viols. He wasn't using this keyed trumpet. He was using a, a natural trumpet. And when they started to rebuild these instruments, because they had old ones to use as models, the music sounded very different. And suddenly, people wanted to play the recorder. You know, the recorder had been out of fashion for hundreds of years, but now people were playing the recorder, people were playing the lute, people were re uh, rediscovering all these wonderful instruments. And so the organists were no different. They said, we, you know, Bach's organ didn't sound like this mighty Wurlitzer thing. It was this beautiful little bright tone, and uh, it wouldn't have the same sound at all. So there was a reaction, and they started to build these uh, Baroque-style organs, and a lot of churches brought them into the churches. And in fact, I think that was a mistake in most cases. As a church organist, when I had to play at churches that just had a Baroque organ, you couldn't really do anything but Baroque music on it. It didn't sound very good with anything else. So instead, what uh, came up was what's called the American Classic Organ. The American classic organ was a 
attempt to hit a compromise, something that could sound sort of Baroque, sort of romantic, you know, sort of jazzy if you wanted jazz. Um, and what they discovered was that you could get an or organ that kind of did all of these things. You know, it wasn't great for any of them, but it was passable for all of them. And that became the American classic organ. And most of the organs that I've played uh, that were electronic organs have been of that style. And it's a great style. You can do lots of really cool things. Our organ here is a version of the American classic organ. And I'll talk about it in a minute. OK. The new frontier, digital electronic organs. So after all of these engineers had spent all of this time and effort to figure out how to get oscillators to sound like instruments, uh, digital recording came along and somebody said, you know what, if you want to sound exactly like this pipe organ, just go make a recording of every note on that pipe organ. Digitally, we can reproduce it and give you the sound of that pipe organ. You don't have to analyze it. You don't have to know how it was made. We're just going to capture that. And so they have done this, and they've built an organ, uh, particularly this outfit called Hauptwerk. And the cool thing, and I've never had a chance to play one yet, is that you can now buy a set and say, I'm going to upload the pipes from the organ in Notre Dame. And now I can play that in my home. No, I want to upload these ones from Radio Music Hall. I can play the Radio Music Hall organ. They've got dozens of these different types of styles of organ that you can now load onto your home instrument or your church instrument and play. So that's, it's, it's not perfect yet, but it's definitely getting really, really good. Uh, and it's, it's certainly the future for electronic instruments. All right. The three organs at Trinity. And this is how I have reconstructed this, folks. If there's people out there who were here at the time and you can correct me, please do. But when I came here and started to, because I immediately saw that you had an organ and I asked Father Jim if I could practice on it and he said yes. Um, I got intrigued because what happened was the church had a pipe organ originally by Wix company, built by Wix, good pipe organ. And then at some point they decided to expand that with an electronic organ but they didn't want to lose the Wix pipes. So they got its outfit called uh, Church Music Systems to build what's called a hybrid. So Church Music Systems bought an electronic organ, or took an electronic organ made by Baldwin called a Prestige II, and then they hooked it up so it could also play the pipes from the Wix organ, which were still here. And so I can play on the Wix organ pipes, or I can play on the Church Music System electronic stops. This is the wackiest Rube Goldberg arrangement you ever saw in your life. I've spent months trying to figure this thing out. I've only gotten to the place where I can play half the Wix pipes at this point, uh, but I'm going to eventually learn to play all of them. And my wonderful organ tuner friend, Scott Thompson, has been here many times with me trying this and that to get it to work. Um, but we have, like I say, gotten, the, gotten to the place where we can play two of the four ranks of pipes from the uh, Wix organ, and he came just a few days ago and tuned them up, so you'll get to hear them today. And then the third one is uh, the Auburn, and it's by its church music systems, not computer music systems, church music systems organ. The Auburn is the little organ back there by the choir, and it's a charming little instrument, just a darling little instrument, very much in that uh, revival um, mode. It really is built to sound like a, a North German uh, organ, and it's uh, a load of fun to play. I'm going to be playing a couple of numbers on that as well. Okay, how are we doing on time? Oh boy, I zoomed through it this time. Okay, great. We got plenty of time to for me to answer questions and then get set up. Yes. Yeah. So those are those are the pipes. If we weren't in COVID times, I would take you on a tour back there and show you uh, the pipes but they are back behind that screen. Let me put my mask on, because I'm making everybody else do this. Okay, here we go. And you can still hear me? Okay. Any other questions? Things you've always wanted to know about organs, yeah. Oh, now that I don't know. Interesting. 
Yeah, it didn't happen. Uh, that would be interesting. It, it is. I mean, I love all organs, and you know, I I have really learned to to make I think some very nice music with this instrument. But it's it's a tricky temperamental thing, I'll tell you. Uh, churches all over the place are getting rid of their organs, which is just a a tragedy. And I told you that they had an organ in the uh, the school where they will now have Sonoma Arts Live, they threw it in the dump. I was just heartbroken when I heard this, you know, but they go, well, yeah, well, what are we going to do with it? You know, we just took it to the dump. Uh, the Congregational Church here had a beautiful 1895 organ built in San Francisco by Bergstrom. They were going to get rid of it, but luckily the Klein family stepped in and took it over and moved it into their winery, into the barrel room. And I get to go every Monday and play this 1895 organ. If you ever want to drop by at 1 o'clock on a Monday um, to the Jacuzzi Winery, I'm not performing. I'm just goofing around. They just want somebody to play the instrument and you know, keep it going and report any problems with it. But it's a fun little uh, instrument. Built 1895, but you know, it could have been built in 1795. It's got pumps in the back for somebody to pump it. They added a blower later. But it's got two keyboards, it's got a pedal keyboard, and you can, you know, it's got like nine stops all together. But uh, Bach would have been very happy with an organ like that. Any other questions? Yeah, so, so it's no pipe at all. I mean, it's, it's, it's just imagine that I've got a computer attached to a computer, con an organ console. And... I can load up software, which is basically just somebody has sampled every pipe of this organ, whatever it is. So the, the organ at Notre Dame. And now it's those, how to make that sound digitally is uh, stored in that program. So when I push down the keys, it says, oh, he wants to play these stops on this keyboard of this organ, and they, it can reproduce it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I would, I mean, I shouldn't say that either, because the, the fact of the matter is these organ, electronic organs of this period, uh, before they had advanced digital stuff, can sound really good and not so good. You know, some of the stops are really kind of like a vacuum cleaner, and it's not, it's not a real musical sound. So that part of it is a bit of a struggle. But, uh, but others of them are gorgeous, you know, and I, I really enjoy playing them. Jim will tell you, I'm here every morning playing this organ because I just, I love it. Um, but overall, for my money, the sound of the pipes is better than the, than the electronic organ, only because of the era when it was built. I see my other sopranos are here. Uh, or more questions. All right. Well, then I'm going to take a minute and, and get us set up for the concert. Those, those of you who are watching at home, you're going to be seeing just sort of a work in progress as we set things up, but, but hang in there. This is an opportunity for folks who have not yet gone to trinitysonoma.org and paid for tickets uh, to do that. All right, I'm going to get to work here. Okay, so Amber and Morgan and Emily, did you need programs? You have one, you have one, you, need, you have one? Okay, fabulous. Uh, just right in the bench is fine.
Yeah, you remember where it is? Okay. And I have a list of things I have to remember to do. Let's see what it is. Okay. Oh, lights on. Let me turn these lights on. Well, that is not going to work. Okay. So we, uh, we're already well in development of this before we decided we had to do this as a virtual concert. So that's why I'm having to do a lot of odd little things here to get things going. Okay, so my audience walked out on me. <laughs> I assume they will be back. And we need to get you a microphone, right? All right, you know how to put that on? Great. Oh, we got all sorts of time. Great. Is there a clip? Oops, not working. No, I, is there a clip? Like on the back. Oh, you need a clip. Yeah. Alfred? It's, I can just, hold on. Okay. Is there like a clip for the big part of this or should you just put it in a pocket? Okay, I can just, I don't have a pocket. I'll just stick it like there, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's not real. <laughs> yeah. No, it's okay. All right. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, let me see. Let me turn this off. Do you need a pencil? Oh, thanks. Like, yeah. <laughs> Well, it's still. I have one, thank you. Yep. This is, I'm out of whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no, 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 no. I have a place to go.
Okay, per perfect. It's very loud now. Okay. Is there a way we could adjust that? Is it on here somewhere? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know what I did. Okay. Okay, thank you. Well, let's let's try this because I'll be playing the keyboard. Uh, and by the way, you know, really, Alfred has been wonderful, Alfred Escoffier, to help us get this set up so that we could do live streaming. And I appreciate Jim's help as well. Yay! Oh, mine has a clip. Okay, that's much better. Thank you. I have a big voice to begin with. All right. Welcome to this concert called The Sinless and the Sinner. And my name is John Partridge, and I am very, very thrilled to have one, three wonderful sopranos with me today. We've got Amber Marsh, we've got Emily Evans, and we've got Morgan Harrington. And uh, we're going to be doing organ music and also some vocal compositions of mine. And they're centered around uh, two very important figures in the New Testament, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary Magdalene. And these are really interesting characters. Um, when I first started to read the Bible as a kid, I was just fascinated by these Bible stories and the people in them and trying to imagine who they were, why they were doing the things they were doing. And it has been the impetus for me over the years to write a number of pieces. I've written oratorios and cantatas and 
uh, anthems and plays and skits and musicals all on Bible themes because I'm so fascinated by this. So tonight you're going to hear excerpts from some of these pieces uh, that I've written. I'm going to start with an organ piece. So the first half of the concert is kind of around the nativity. And the organ piece I'm going to play is in Dolce Jubilo, which we know in our hymnal as Good Christian Friends Rejoice or Good Christian Men Rejoice. This is a choral prelude. For years, everybody thought Johann Sebastian Bach wrote it. When I learned it, that's what I was told. But now scholars have decided it was by another Bach, not Johann Sebastian Bach. But anyway, it's a gorgeous piece of music. This is in Dolce Jubilo. Thank you. All right. Now we're going to have the first vocal piece, and Emily Evans is going to be singing this. It's called Tapestry. And this came from a uh, children's musical. Uh, I did not write the children's musical. It's called Sleep Over at the Stable. But I had the, such a talented little girl in my choir, I wanted to give her a solo, so I wrote this for her. And so this is about what we Christians call the Annunciation, when Gabriel comes to Mary and tells her that she's going to have this baby Jesus, who's going to be the Messiah. But of course, that's both a good thing and a bad thing, because this is going to be a source of tremendous pain for her in her life to see her son crucified. So that's what this is about. Tapestry. Mary sitting at the loom in your quiet little room while you wonder what your life has in store. 
winding threads of black and white, weaving daydreams in the night, while a stranger takes the path to your door. Back and forth goes the shuttle of our years, and our lives are a tapestry of laughter and tears. Here's an angel dressed in light, come from heaven's highest height, with a blessing and a burden for you. Will you take the gift that's given? Will you help the work of heaven? Can you bear this thing God wants you to do? Back and forth goes the shuttle of our years and our lives are a tapestry of laughter and tears. So be a thread in God's hand. Be woven into God's plan. Bear God this child in pain and joy. Lord of lords and little boy, let God put you to the test. Give your word and do your best. Place your life on heaven's loom and be blessed. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. All right. I mentioned in the re lecture on organs that uh, in the middle, uh, early period of the organ development, they really liked this brassy uh, sound, reedy sound that they got from what they call the reed pipes. And this is a piece that shows those off. Uh, it was written by the guy who was the uh, music director at the King's Chapel in France, and he took some uh, foreign Christmas carols and set them. So this is called Noël Étranger, and we're going to hear it right now.
So that was an example of the um, church music systems organ that we have here. Uh, electronic stops, and it sounds pretty good. So now I'm going to go back to the little Alborn organ and play, uh, first of all, a choral prelude called Wachet auf uns die Stimme, which is the carol that we know in English as Wake Awake, or Christians uh, Wake. The and it's an Advent carol. Okay, so this is by J.G. Walter, who was uh, contemporary of Bach's. In fact, he was related to Bach. So as I said, this, this little Auburn was built to sound like a northern German uh, organ from the Baroque era, but it can also play other things. And I'm going to a piece from the Johannes Brahms. Uh, his choral prelude on Es ist ein Ros entsprungen, which we know in English as Lo, How, a Rose.
Thank you. All right. Now we're going to have a vo another vocal piece. Uh, and this comes from one of the very interesting stories in Luke. We are told that Mary, when she was pregnant with Jesus, went to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who was pregnant with John the Baptist. And there's this wonderful scene where Elizabeth says to Mary, when I heard your greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy. And then our Bible says, Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. And she sells this beautiful poem, which has been extracted out of the Bible and set to music many times by many composers. However, in some of the early manuscripts, it's not Mary who says this poem at all. It's Elizabeth who says it. So that's an interesting thought. And so I decided to give it to both of them as a duet. So this is a duet. Amber is playing Elizabeth. Emily is playing Mary. And this is my setting and my paraphrase of Magnificat. We ready? My soul rejoices and I start to sing. My God has chosen me to do this wonderful thing. Now the poor are lifted up. God has filled their cup while the rich he has sent empty away. Who am I that God would do this for me? In my lifetime I see my Savior born in this wonderful way. My soul rejoices and I start to sing. And all the nations of the world are blessed. Now the poor are lifted up. God has filled their cup while the rich he has sent empty away. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. By the way, it is really tough to sing wearing a mask. I want you to know these, these women are doing a fabulous, fabulous job in very difficult circumstances. Okay, so that was uh, my setting of the Magnificat. It said, as I said, many, many times. And uh, one setting, which was in a plain chant version of it, Bach used the beginning of it as a subject for a fugue. So I'm going to play uh, Bach's Fugue on Magnificat, and this is going to be on the Wix organ. So these are the pipes that are back there. Let's just see if I got them. Okay. Nope. 
That's not right. Hang on. Okay, now we got it. Okay, this is the Wix.
All right. So now we're going to come to uh, an excerpt from a very big piece of mine called Chiaroscuro. Chiaroscuro is a gigantic piece that takes place over three different performances, one on Christmas Eve, one on uh, Good Friday, and one on Easter. So this is from the Christmas Eve service. And the whole thing about Chiaroscuro is the fight between God and the devil, between light and dark. And so we have the nativity going on and the shepherds in the fields before they've been uh, talked to by the angels uh, are praying to God to send the Messiah to save them. The Romans have come. They've taken over the country. It's this terrible situation. But the devil is always at work trying to pull people away from trust in God. So he gets one of these shepherds, a woman named Judith, and tells her her brother has just been killed by the Romans. And she's really angry and upset. And he's saying, yes, you know, God isn't going to stop this stuff from happening. You've got to stop it. You've got to fight against the Romans. So she goes back to the other shepherds and is just enraged to see them here, just passively praying to God for help. She's saying, God is not going to help us. We have got to go and fight. So Morgan is playing Judith, and Amber and Emily are playing the uh, shepherds. Oops. Am I still on? Okay, good. Are we ready? David, Moses, Elijah, Saul, Aaron, Solomon, Samuel, down someplace. <laughs> it's on the pew. Oh, thank you. Okay, we're going to finish up the first half, which is sort of about the nativity, with uh, the visit of the three wise men. So I'm going to play an arrangement of We Three Kings of Orient R that I've done, 
and it calls for a stop that we do not have here, okay? An organ stop called a Zingelsturm, which is little bells, little bells that are actually on a thing that looks like a star, and it turns, and the little bells go tingly, 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 ding. Since we don't have one, I have uh, taken it upon myself to use the sacristy bell uh, as part of this composition. And this is on the uh, uh, church music system organ, the electronic organ. All right. We're going to take a very, very short intermission, just a couple of minutes, uh, and then we're going to start up with the second half. Those of you who are uh, listening at home, if you have not taken the time to yet to go and buy your tickets for this concert, there's a link at www.trinitysonoma.org. All the proceeds from this go into the church's Performing Arts Fund. We'll start up again in just two or three minutes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Oh, sure. Do whatever you need to do. We, let me tur I'll turn on the other uh, gobos, too. I think that's pretty much all we got. Well, oh, okay, you can turn on the uh, aisle lights if that helps. Okay, so as I said, uh, we're going to start up the second half now. And this is now talking about Mary Magdalene. She is a very uh, interesting and controversial figure. There's still lots of discussion today about her. And... Um, from a compositional point of view, I have made some choices that not everyone would agree with, so I'm going to talk about them very quickly. There are several stories in the Bible uh, that are traditionally considered to be about Mary Magdalene, even though she isn't named as the person in the story. And one very important one is the woman who comes to Jesus and washes his feet with her tears and dries them with her hair. And while this is happening, Jesus is at the house of a rich man who says to himself, if Jesus knew who this woman was, he wouldn't let her touch him. So there's the implication that she's dirty in some way, a moral woman. And so the tradition has been that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. Um, there's also, we know from the Bible, that Jesus cast demons out of Mary Magdalene. And to my mind, those things fit together, that a woman who is emotionally disturbed might end up in this kind of a role of uh, an outcast. So we explore that in several pieces. Uh, You'll Never Know is also from Chiaroscuro, and this is uh, Mary Magdalene singing. I wrote this piece initially because I was asked by the National Institute for Mental Health uh, to provide music for an ecumenical church service. And I was talking to the priest about what they wanted, and he said something that really struck me. He said, you know, with these people who have depression or bipolar or whatever, we don't even think about cure. We're just trying to manage their symptoms. And I thought that, you know, for, for a Christian who thinks that God can do anything to say there's, this is a hopeless situation struck me as very odd. But also, I have known people in my life who've had these kinds of mental issues, and it is a terrible thing, and there's a terrible loneliness associated with these mental states. So that's what I was trying to get at in this. Um, Amber is going to be the uh, Mary Magdalene figure in this, okay? And, and Morgan and Emily and I are the chorus. They're all giving me this look like I'm doing the wrong thing. Is this the right piece now? Oh, <laughs> all right. That's good to know. We'll come back to this song in a minute. I'm going to play a few. Thank you, yes. So this is a fugue that I wrote, fugue in G minor, uh, on the um, CWS organ.
Thank you. Okay, now are we ready? Yes. <laughs> So in, again, in this scene, Mary is with her sister Martha and her brother Lazarus, and she's trying to explain to them what is going on with her mentally. so much okay another fugue and this is going to be on the Wix organ pipes and this is uh, by the way this is dedicated to a woman named Adele Lemon I hope her daughter uh, Nancy Lemon is listening she uh, Adele was a very important person to me in my life when I was a uh, young man in high school and college and uh, she, Adele passed away recently, and we haven't been able to have a memorial for her because of COVID. So this piece is dedicated to her. It was dedicated to her when I wrote it years ago, too. Okay.
Thank you. All right. So now uh, we get to talking about Jesus in his ministry. And in the course of his ministry, he encounters three different women, uh, each one a really fascinating character. So the first one is the woman at the well, right? A Samaritan woman that he meets. And there's a lot of stuff going on in this story. The Jews and the Samaritans don't get along at all. They don't talk to each other. They don't have anything to do with each other. And yet he asks this woman to give him something to drink. She's really surprised at this. And eventually he starts to talk to her. I could give you the living water that you would drink of this water. You'd never be thirsty again. And then it comes out, uh, he says to her, go home and, and talk to your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. And he says, that's right. You had three husbands. You have none. And the man you're living with now is not your husband. So then she thinks, who is this person who knows these secrets about me? Could he be the Messiah? Right? And so as I was thinking about this woman, again, I thought about somebody who's, who's had just this terrible luck with men. Right? Just everything has gone wrong in her life is around men. So the woman at the well is going to be played by Morgan Harrington. And then the second woman that he meets is this woman with a hemorrhage. And we've been told that she's been bleeding for eight years. She spent everything she has on doctors and medicines. Nothing has helped. And she gets to this marketplace to try to have Jesus heal her and there's this gigantic crowd and how is she going to get to him and she says if I know if I could just touch the hem of his garment that I would be healed so uh, Amber is going to be playing the woman with the hemorrhage and then the last character is Mary Magdalene and again a woman who is uh, has a lot of personal demons that have driven her to this a life of promiscuity and Jesus has saved her so she goes to him to say, to thank him, but also because she knows that somebody who would forgive someone like her, the world isn't going to forgive him. And so she says, before you die, I want to thank you for what you did for me, and let me wash your feet with my tears. And so Emily is playing Mary Magdalene. All right, the three women.
Beautiful, beautiful job. Thank you so much. What a thrill to hear a piece of mine sung by these incredible artists. It's just overwhelming. All right, I talked about um, the French and Romantic organ traditions where they like these thick, dark kind of uh, textures. I'm going to play a piece like that by Louis Vierne called Triambu. Okay, so uh, some of you who were here for Easter last year or saw the, the broadcast that we did of Easter last year will know that Morgan sang beautifully, I Know That My Redeemer Liveth. And when I knew that I was going to get to finally work with her, for various reasons we kind of tried various projects that never panned out, uh, I started to write a piece for her to sing, but it wasn't finished in time for Easter. So it's finished now, and we're going to have the premiere performance of Tell Us Mary Magdalene. Uh, 
and so this is the story that Mary is the first person to see the risen Jesus, right? She goes to the tomb. The body isn't there. She meets this person she thinks is a gardener, and then it's revealed that he's Jesus. Um, in another version of the story, it's an angel who tells the, her to go back and tell the disciples that Jesus has gone before them into Galilee and that he's going to meet them there. So this, uh, this piece is of Mary coming back to talk to the disciples about what has happened. So Morgan is playing Mary Magdalene, Amber and Emily are playing the disciples. And I'm playing it on the organ stop on my little Yamaha keyboard. Are we ready? I'm sorry, let me try that once more. This doesn't sound right. Let's have the soprano sing a bow, please. Wonderful, wonderful job. Thank you so much for joining us today. 
And thank you, yes. By the way, uh, Morgan and Emily and I are going to be in a play just across the parking lot put on by Sonoma Arts Live towards the end of February. They both are amazing in this play, so you should definitely come and hear it. It's called Master Class, put on by Sonoma Arts Live. We're going to finish up with a fun organ piece. Uh, this is by Dietrich Buxtehude, one of my favorite Baroque composers. And it's a fugue, sometimes called the Jig Fugue, because it's kind of like a jig. Wait for the truck to go by. All right. Thank you so very much for coming today. Uh, it's been a thrill sharing some of my love of the organ and, of course, the wonderful talents of these three singers. See you soon. <laughs>